uh, the first resurrection. Um, Revelation 20, verse 4, is the vision John sees of the first resurrection. And like everything else in Revelation, John's not seeing the actual events here. What he's seeing are images and symbols that represent those events. And this image here is not unlike the image of the seven lampstands in chapter 1. Remember, we are immediately told what those seven lampstands represent. They are the seven churches. In like manner, in Revelation 20, we are told, point blank, this is the first resurrection. When John follows this pattern, there's really no room for interpretation. In fact, there's no need for it. He's literally telling the reader what the image represents. The meaning is given. Basically, it's a no-brainer that John expects his readers to be familiar with. That being said, there's only one resurrection that would fit the bill as the first resurrection, and that would be the resurrection of Christ Himself. He was the first to rise from the dead, the first fruits of those who had fallen asleep, and the firstborn of the dead. As G.K. Beale says, these parallels to Revelation 20, 4 through 6, are too close to be coincidental, but imply that the first resurrection is Christ's resurrection. Indeed, it's hard to imagine what, that John's readers would have thought of anything else when they heard the words, this is the first resurrection. Having said that, however, the image that John sees in the vision involves more than one individual. He sees they that sat upon the thrones, the, so, the souls of those who had been beheaded, those who had not worshipped the beast. They came to life and reigned with Christ, etc. So, he's seeing a group of individuals who somehow take part in Christ's resurrection. As the next verse says, Blessed and holy is he who has a part in the first resurrection. So, Christ's resurrection was the first resurrection, and those on the thrones in Revelation 20 have a part in that resurrection. Now, typically, this is understood in terms of the believer's new life in Christ, symbolized by Christian baptism. For example, Chilton writes, He rose from the dead and resurrected all believers with Him. Christ's resurrection is the definitive resurrection which took place on the third day. We participate in His resurrection through covenantal baptism so that we walk in newness of life. In my opinion, while this idea is doctrinally sound in and of itself, there seems to be way more going on in this passage than simply the believer's spiritual identification with Christ. John is very specific here and far too precise to be speaking simply of the common experience of the new birth. As Ken Gentry says, I do not believe this is a proper exegetical position here in Revelation 20. In other words, this view is good theology but bad exegesis if we try to draw it from Revelation 20. Ken continues, Since he saw souls on the thrones, and since he specifically mentions beheaded persons, and since in the context they came to life, he seems quite clearly to be referring only to deceased believers in heaven. And Gentry narrows it down even further. Not only are these enthroned ones deceased, but they are deceased under specific circumstances. They have been judicially killed. Beheaded is a standard form of capital punishment well known in the Roman Empire. Now, keep in mind, 
The beheading of these individuals is, once again, an image in a vision. Remember, John's not seeing the actual events. He's seeing images and symbols that represent those events. So, they may have suffered martyrdom under any number of circumstances. This is a specific image meant to convey the general idea of martyrdom. Nonetheless, these weren't just martyrs in general. These were martyrs who were killed because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the Word of God. Now, we might think of the testimony of Jesus as something restricted to the New Testament. But remember, Yeshua told the Pharisees, it is these, meaning the Old Testament scriptures, that testify of me. Later he says, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. And in Luke 24, Yeshua states that he has been written about in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. In other words, the entire Old Testament contains the testimony of Jesus. So, the testimony of Jesus isn't just the New Testament, nor is it restricted to New Testament times. From the Old Testament prophets to the New Testament apostles, it's all about Jesus and the testimony of Jesus. And in Revelation 20, it's all about martyrs who died for that testimony. What all of this means is that those saints who are on the thrones in Revelation 20 are not living Christians, spiritually raised with Christ by the new birth. Again, while this concept is clearly taught elsewhere in Scripture, it's clearly not what John is tracking on here in Revelation 20. Those on the thrones are specifically martyrs who somehow took part in Christ's resurrection, the first resurrection in A.D. 30. This is the picture that John paints for his readers, and it's something they're supposed to be familiar with. <clears throat> Excuse me, the voice is given out. <laughs> with that in mind, Matthew informs us that at the moment of Yeshua's death, the temple veil was torn, and a large group of saints rose from the dead. These saints waited in their tombs until Christ himself was raised and then proceeded forth as well. Matthew 27, 50 through 53 states, And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. And the tombs were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of their tombs, after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Thus, Christ was not the only one to come out of his tomb on that Sunday morning, the third day after his crucifixion. Others followed. And what's really interesting to note is, this was to be expected. The Old Testament predicted as much. Luke and Paul both state that Yeshua's resurrection on the third day was prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures. <clears throat> Luke says, It is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. And Paul says, He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, how often have we read this without looking up exactly where in the Old Testament this third day resurrection is to be found? If you've ever done this, you know there is only one passage that fits the bill. And that passage would be Hosea 6.2. And it reads, He will revive us after two days. He will raise us us up on the third day, that we may live before him. As Phil Kayser says, commentators point out that this is the only passage that explicitly mentions a resurrection on the third day. 
But notice the we. There are other saints who would be raised with Christ on that third day in A.D. 30. It wouldn't just be Jesus. Consequently then, the others who came out of their tombs after Yeshua's resurrection in Matthew 27 should come as no surprise to us. It was to be expected based upon the Old Testament passage that foretold of the event on the third day after the crucifixion. Thus, John's readers could easily identify the first resurrection of Revelation 20 with Christ's own resurrection, and they would have no problem processing the fact that others had a part in that resurrection. The question now becomes, who were these others who were raised with Christ on that third day? Well, it would seem Matthew himself gives us the answer if we'd only take the time to follow the clues he gives us in the text. Matthew identifies them as the saints or the holy ones and says they came out of the tombs. This terminology would have been very familiar to Matthew's readers. In chapter 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous. You say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. You testify against yourselves in that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. In all likelihood, the tombs of Matthew 27 contain the bodies of those prophets and righteous martyrs in Matthew 23. As Andy Johnson writes, it seems likely that the holy ones is a way of referring to the prophets and the righteous of Matthew 23, 29. Their appearance implies God's judgment on their behalf and against Jerusalem and its leaders who put the faithful son to death. Likewise, Charles Corliss writes, The saints appear to be synonymous with the righteous and thus may refer to the innocent martyrs mentioned in Matthew 23. Then he adds, both 23, 29 and 27, 52 refer to the tombs of the righteous or holy, and Matthew is likely to be intending a cross-reference here. Now, I like the word he uses, cross-reference. Remember, they didn't have marginal reference Bibles like we do today. There, are no, there were no chapter and verse divisions, and Matthew couldn't put a, you know, a little A or a B next to 2752 telling you to go back to chapter 23 to find out who he's talking about. If Matthew wants the reader to make the connection to Matthew 23, how else could he have done it? There's simply no other way he could have. So, when we look up the cross-references in the margins of our modern Bibles, let's keep in mind that the biblical writers didn't have that luxury. And let's be careful not to miss the cross-references that were originally there in the text to begin with. That being said, there's something else in the text of Matthew 27 that we as modern readers tend to miss. And that is the fact that Matthew's intentionally using the same language here that Ezekiel uses in his vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. Ray Johnson provides the following table showing what he calls the thought connection parallelism between Matthew 27 and the Septuagint version of Ezekiel 37. When you look at the two texts side by side, it's pretty hard to miss the fact that Matthew is purposely using Ezekiel's resurrection language and reframing it to structure his own resurrection narrative in Matthew 27. In both passages, we have the reference to God's Spirit along with an earthquake, the opening of the tombs, 
and the dead proceeding to the Holy Land. As John Grassy puts it, in Matthew 27, the writer describes the resurrection scene following the death of Jesus in terms that strongly suggest Ezekiel 37. Now, to be clear, in its original context, Ezekiel's valley of dry bones is a metaphor for the nation of Israel being dead in exile. They're resurrected as a nation when they return home to the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. The dry bones come to life, so to speak. So, what Matthew's going to do then is to repurpose Ezekiel's material. And there's nothing at all unusual about this. If you've ever taken the time to look up any New Testament quotation of the Old, you'll find that more often than not, the contexts don't really seem to match. And this is a technique that our Jewish friends call midrash. And midrash is basically taking the core theme or idea in a particular passage of Scripture and repurposing it in the current situation being written about in the new text. Matthew himself does this in Matthew 2.15, where the flight of Mary and Jesus, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus into Egypt is said to be in fulfillment of Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt have I called my son. In its original context, Hosea 11.1 1 isn't even a forward-looking prophecy at all. It's a look backward to the time of the Exodus. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the New Testament writers are taking the core of the message or, the core of the message or idea in these Old Testament passages and applying it to the current situation they're writing about. And Matthew's clearly doing that here with respect to Ezekiel 37. And this is widely recognized within the world of biblical scholarship. By and large, scholars agree that Matthew's purposely using the language of Ezekiel's Valley of Dry Bones as a template for his resurrection narrative in Matthew 27. An example, for example, Andy Johnson writes, Matthew's language about the earth or land being shaken, rocks split and graves opened in verses 51 through 53, almost certainly contains allusions to various Old Testament texts, but the language and imagery from Ezekiel 37 stands out. <clears throat> in his commentary on Matthew, Robert Gundry writes, Matthew uses his favorite diction to express what he reads in Ezekiel 37. Conversely, in his commentary on Ezekiel, Daniel Block writes, The description of the resurrection scene in Matthew 27 suggests that this event may have been interpreted in light of Ezekiel 37. So, you have Gundry on the Matthew side of things and Block on the Ezekiel side of things both seeing the same thing going on in these passages. There is, as Doug Anderson notes, general consensus that Matthew 27 is indebted to Ezekiel 37's portrayal of the resurrection. And this is not without good reason. Again, the parallels between the two passages are pretty hard to miss. Thus, Matthew gives us two cross-references in chapter 27, pulling our minds back to the martyred righteous in chapter 23. And the entire episode utilizes the language of Ezekiel's Valley of Dry Bones as a template to frame the narrative. And I want to reiterate, because this is important, this is how scholars, by and large, look at these passages. So there's nothing unique to preterism here. In other words, none of these scholars are going back to these passages and trying to lay the groundwork for a preterist interpretation of Revelation 20. They're just making basic observations and self-evident connections that nobody really disputes. 
with that in mind, there's another passage in the New Testament which carries the theme of resurrected martyrs and in which scholars see a clear connection to Ezekiel 37. And that would be our passage here in Revelation 20. Numerous scholars have noted the strong structural parallels between Ezekiel and Revelation. And this shouldn't surprise us. In his gospel, John makes extensive use of Ezekiel. And true to form, he follows Ezekiel's lead in Revelation as well. As Dr. Wei Lo says, John, as the follower and witness of Jesus Christ, is the true heir of the prophet Ezekiel. Johann Luce writes, There can hardly be any doubts concerning John's dependency on Ezekiel. The numerous implicit quotations of Ezekiel prove this sufficiently. And according to Alan Bandy, the book of Ezekiel appears to influence Revelation's structure more broadly than any other Old Testament book. And note what he says next, the influence of Ezekiel on Revelation has reached the status of scholarly consensus. In other words, there's really no dispute that the book of Ezekiel functions as a template for the way in which John conveys his message in Revelation. And <clears throat> this is especially the case with regard to Revelation's structure. And this is the key point, Revelation's structure. After noting how the book of Revelation resembles a covenant lawsuit, David Chilton adds, but there is at least one other factor that has greatly influenced the outline of Revelation. It is constructed with strict adherence to one of the most famous covenant lawsuits of all time, the prophecy of Ezekiel. Revelation's dependence upon the language and imagery of Ezekiel has long been recognized. But St. John does more than make literary allusions to Ezekiel. He follows him step by step. Revelation is a Christian rewriting of Ezekiel. Its fundamental structure is the same. Its interpretation depends upon Ezekiel. Now, to illustrate this, Chilton provides the following side-by-side -side comparison of the two books clearly showing this. And notice, where does Ezekiel 37 fall in line in Chilton's chart? It falls right in line with Revelation 20, 4 through 6. Ian Boxall has a similar table demonstrating Ezekiel's influence on the book of Revelation. Again, where does Ezekiel 37 line up? Boxall puts it this way, Revelation 20, 4 through 6, equals Ezekiel 37. Focusing on the final sequence of visions, in both prophets, Steve Moyes has this chart. Notice, again, what does Ezekiel's Valley of Dry Bones line up with? Again, it's the first resurrection of Revelation 20. This is just a small sampling of the consensus regarding the relationship between Ezekiel and Revelation. So, Chilton wasn't exaggerating. John follows Ezekiel meticulously every step of the way, and he adds this crucial insight. The book of Revelation was intended from the beginning to be a series of readings in worship throughout the church year to be read in tandem with the prophecy of Ezekiel. This being the case then, John expected that the first resurrection, Revelation 20, would be read alongside of the Valley of Dry Bones, Ezekiel 37. If Revelation's interpretation depends upon Ezekiel, how then was John proposing his readers understand the first resurrection of Revelation 20? Evidently, 
the expectation was that they understand it in light of Ezekiel 37. Peter Lightheart puts it together. He writes, This is not just a matter of scattered illusions. Rather, Revelation overall, and in specific sections, follows the order of Ezekiel precisely. With this in mind, he observes, The most intriguing of these connections is that between the resurrection scene of Ezekiel 37 and the first resurrection of Revelation 20. The Revelation verse has been a difficult crux for a long time, but the link with Ezekiel might help resolve it. Now, Lightheart calls the first resurrection of Revelation 20 a difficult crux. But it would seem these very scholars have already solved that difficult crux without even realizing it. Just think about it. If A equals B and B equals C, then A also equals C. Consequently, if Matthew 27 equals Ezekiel 37 and Ezekiel 37 equals Revelation 20, then Matthew 27 equals Revelation 20. The same academic community that sees the connection between Matthew 27 and Ezekiel 37 on the one hand and Ezekiel 37 and Revelation 20 on the other hand seems to miss what happens when we put two and two together and see the picture it creates when the dots are connected. As they say, scholars are really good at taking the Bible apart, but they don't know how to put it back together again. Matthew and John are both painting the same picture. And the first resurrection of Revelation 20 is the resurrection of the saints coming out of their tombs in Matthew 27. Give me one minute here. The voice is going. With that in mind, however, there would seem to be another difficult crux that needs resolved. The martyrs of Revelation 20 are those who didn't worship the beast or take his mark. As preterists, we correctly identify the beast with Nero Caesar or the Roman Empire. But here's the thing. Nero wasn't even born until 37 AD, and he didn't start persecuting Christians until 64 AD. So how could Old Testament saints be the martyrs killed by the beast if they lived and died long before there even was a beast? Well, we ask this question because we tend to look at the beast solely in terms of Nero Caesar and first century Rome. We need to erase that thinking from our minds and realize John's not coming up with a new idea here. He's recycling an old one. Even before they got his letter from Patmos, John's readers would have been all too familiar with the beast and the imagery he's using. Yes, Nero is clearly in view in John's vision. His footprints are all over Revelation. But, and there's no doubt about that, but the beast imagery itself is about so much more than merely Nero or first century Rome. The reality of it is, anytime God's people stayed true to Yahweh, amidst foreign oppression and apostate leadership, they were resisting the beast. When John's readers read about the beast, they would not have asked, what is the beast? They would have asked, what is the beast this time? The beast imagery has deep roots in the Old Testament and Jewish tradition. The beast of which John speaks predates the first century. When John spoke of one beast rising from the sea, and another beast coming from the land, his original audience would have recognized the imagery immediately. As G.K. Beale says, the Jewish tradition held that on the fifth day of creation, God created Leviathan to be in the sea and Behemoth to dwell on the land. 
These two beasts, continues Beale, were symbolic of the powers of evil and were to be destroyed at the final judgment. With regard to John's usage of this imagery, in Revelation, Joseph Poon writes, The allusion to Leviathan and Behemoth is explicit in Revelation 13. As in the chapter, the beast coming from the sea and the beast coming from the land are clearly stated. Thus, David Chilton's chapter on Revelation 13 is aptly titled Leviathan and Behemoth. Chilton knew that John was applying a familiar historical motif to a current contemporary situation. John's using familiar images from the Old Testament to get his reader's attention. And Richard Engel explains how these two beasts took on the persona they did in the Old Testament. He writes, In their ferocity and strength to devour, they became a symbol for great kings and empires who punished Israel or whom Israel should avoid. Thus, the prophet Ezekiel uses the Leviathan language with regard to the Egyptian Pharaoh. He says, Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of the streams. The Hebrew word lurking behind the English dragon is tanin. And it's simply another way of referring to Leviathan in the ancient world. Isaiah uses the same word coupled with another term for Leviathan, Rahab. Speaking of Egypt and the original Exodus, he says, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut? Rahab into pieces who pierced the dragon. Now, what's Isaiah doing? What's going on in this passage? Well, he's calling on God to do what he's done in the past. He's asking him to defeat the dragon once again. In other words, Pharaoh was the dragon last time. Nebuchadnezzar is the dragon this time. And the Leviathan language here, Rahab and dragon, makes perfect sense because the prophets refer to Nebuchadnezzar the same way during the Babylonian occupation. Jeremiah says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has devoured me and crushed me. He has set me down like an empty vessel. He has swallowed me like a monster. Notice, there's that same word we saw in reference to Pharaoh, meaning tanin, meaning dragon, serpent, or sea monster. Only this time, Nebuchadnezzar is the tanin. In Revelation, then, John simply takes up the mantle of the prophets who went before him. But now, it's Nero following in the footsteps of these evil rulers prophetically cast as chaos monsters or sea beasts. This is all stuff that John expects his readers to be familiar with. And this includes the symbolism behind the mark of the beast. As Gary DeMar says, every Jew would have understood what a mark on the hand and forehead meant. Indeed, speaking of God's law, Exodus 13, 9 says, and it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. Likewise, speaking of God's law, Deuteronomy says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be on the frontals of your forehead and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So the sign on the hand and forehead symbolize God's law governing their thoughts and actions. 
Thus, in Revelation, John contrasts the mark of the beast with the commandments of God. He says, They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God. So, keeping the commandments of God and staying faithful to Him is the exact opposite of taking the mark of the beast. And taking the mark of the beast is the exact opposite of keeping God's commandments and staying faithful to Him. John's audience had a choice to make just as those in the Old Testament had that same choice to make. A case in point would be Daniel's three friends who would not bow down to the golden idol in Babylon. As Simon Price observes, St. John interpreted and condemned the imperial cult in religious terms. Other Jewish and Christian sources also show how the imperial image was seen in light of biblical history. The book of Daniel recounts the story of three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who refused to serve the God of Nebuchadnezzar and worship the golden statue which he had made. And these three young men were proto-martyrs in the eyes of the early church. The idea of Daniel's three friends as proto-martyrs comports well with the suggestion that those on the thrones in Revelation 20 were those who resisted the beast in its past manifestations. And these were to serve as an encouragement to those who were under the altar in Revelation 6 who were currently coming out of the Great Tribulation and resisting the beast in its present manifestation, namely Nero or Rome. The proto-martyrs, the ones on the thrones in Revelation 20, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, continue to let God's law be the sign on their hand and forehead. It was the sign that governed their thoughts and their actions as they resisted the beast then embodied in the Babylonian Empire. John's calling upon the first century Christians, those facing the Great Tribulation, to walk in the footsteps of these faithful heroes from the past. Thus, to resist the beast and not take the mark is to walk the path that they walked. And being familiar with Psalm 74, John's readers would have made the connection. Psalm 74 was written during the Babylonian occupation. In other words, during the time that Daniel and his three friends were in exile. In the midst of the destruction and devastation caused by the Babylonians, the psalmist, like Isaiah, calls upon God to reenact the Exodus deliverance. He says, Yet God is my king from long ago, who performs acts of salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. There's that Exodus connection. Next, he says, you broke the heads of the sea monsters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. Again, he's looking to, the, to what God has done in the past, and he's asking him to do it again. And notice the Leviathan language that undergirds the whole thing. Next, the psalmist says, Remember this, O Lord, that the enemy has taunted you. A foolish people has treated your name, the name of Yahweh, disrespectfully. Do not give the soul of your turtle dove to the wild animal. Do not give the life of your do not forget the life of your afflicted forever. <clears throat> Notice in the Septuagint version, the same word is used here for wild animal that John uses for beast in Revelation. So you have the Leviathan language being used in tandem with the beast imagery, just like we find in Revelation. But that's not the only connection to what's going on in Revelation. Earlier, the psalmist says, Step toward the irreparable ruins, 
The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. Your adversaries have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They have set up their own standards as signs. They have burned all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. So, in the turmoil of foreign occupation, the psalmist bellows, the adversaries have set up their own standards as signs and laments the fact that God's people do not see their signs. This is the same word for sign that's used in Exodus 13 and Deuteronomy 6, where God's law is to be the sign on the hands and foreheads of His people. Additionally, remember that these signs were to be written on the doorposts of their houses and gates as well. This all makes perfect sense since Psalm 74 is set in the context of the Babylonian invasion under Nebuchadnezzar. The Israelites' homeland had been devastated and their gates and doorposts were destroyed. And the Babylonians had set up their own standards as signs. In other words, God's people were given a new foreign set of laws and commands. They were given new standards as signs with which to govern their thoughts, symbolized by the forehead, and direct their actions, symbolized by the hand. Those who stayed true to Yahweh, like Daniel and his three friends, would continue to let God's law be the sign on their hands and foreheads. Despite the pressure to succumb to the foreign power, they refused to bow to the idols of false gods. And John's whole purpose then in characterizing Nero or Rome as the beast is meant to recall past endurance on the part of God's people against Israel's beastly enemies. He does this in order to encourage his readers to persevere in their present situation. Now, if the beast imagery and everything that goes with it was unfamiliar to his readers, he would have no point of reference in this regard. They would have been as baffled and confused by the beast imagery as we are today. But remember, he wrote to be understood. He was trying to communicate with them, not confuse them. So it's precisely because he does have that common point of reference that John is able to weave together themes and images from ages long ago. The full force of John's message is diluted if there was no beast prior to the first century. This beast that his readers were now facing had been faced by God's people before. The beast was Pharaoh. The beast was Nebuchadnezzar. And now the beast is Nero. So, do we have a pre-first century beast in the Bible that makes those risen martyrs in Matthew 27, martyrs killed by the beast. Well, if Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the psalmist have anything to say about it, we sure do. And this is the key to understanding how the martyrs of Revelation 20 could possibly be the saints who rose with Christ in Matthew 27, around A.D. 30. They are those who did not worship the beast or take his mark in any of its past manifestations during times of foreign oppression and apostate leadership. They were raised with Christ himself and took part in his resurrection, which was the first resurrection. And I figured I'd better say something about this. I know the popular view of our day is that those raised again in Matthew 27 did not go up to heaven when Jesus did, but rather they continued to live on earth for some time after before dying again. But Hebrews 9.27 is pretty clear to me. It is destined for people to die once. Scripture interpret scripture, and we would do well to follow the older commentaries with regard to Matthew 27. 
For example, John Calvin. What became of those saints afterwards? It would appear absurd to suppose that, after having been once admitted by Christ to the participation of a new life, they again returned to dust. It is more probable which, that the life which they received was not afterwards taken from them. For if it had been a mortal life, it would not have been proof of a perfect resurrection. So it was proper that he should bestow on none but his saints the distinguished honor of rising along with him. Likewise, John Gill. These saints, I apprehend, continued on earth until our Lord's ascension, and then joining the retinue of angels, went triumphantly with him to heaven as trophies of his victory over sin, Satan, death, and the grave. And finally, Matthew Henry pretty much summarizes my whole message here today when he writes, What if we should suppose that they were martyrs who, in Old Testament times, had sealed the truths of God with their blood and were thus dignified and distinguished? Christ particularly points to them as his forerunners in Matthew 23. And remember, we talked about that earlier. And next, Henry puts it together. And we find in Revelation 20 that those who were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus arose before the rest of the dead. Sufferers with Christ, says Henry, shall reign with Christ first. Unlike so many in our own day, Matthew Henry made the connection between Matthew 27 and Revelation 20. And this puts the first resurrection, along with the binding of Satan and all the rest of Revelation 20, squarely in the past from our perspective. And this is so important because we need to know where we stand on God's timetable so we can know what we're supposed to be doing and who He expects us to be. We're not in the millennium now, and we're certainly not waiting for it to start. Revelation chapter 20 is behind us. <clears throat> Our reality is chapters 21 to 22. As such, we should be leading the nations to the healing leaves of the tree of life, Revelation 22 too. And the kings of the earth should be bringing the glory and honor of the nations in, Revelation 21, 25 through 26. But God's people will never start living in the fulfillment that He's laid out for us today and doing the job He's called us to do today as long as we continue to interpret already fulfilled prophecy as yet unfulfilled. And that's why, you know, a proper understanding of Revelation 20 is so imperative for our own day and age. We need to know what time it is and what we're supposed to be doing, but we can't do that if we're stuck in chapter 20. Or even worse, if we're stuck in the earlier chapters like our dispensational friends. It's hampering the impact on the world that we should be making as His image bearers in the new creation of Revelation 21 through 22. And, uh, you know, God's people need to wake up and rise up and realize what time it is. And until that happens, we'll never get to work as His image bearers in this new creation that we're all supposed to be a part of. And the world just continues to uh, suffer the consequences. And let me just... Okay, I got a, I got a couple minutes because I, I wrote a couple things down here kind of like not on my notes, but... Uh, I think it goes along with this. Um, I think um, Dr. Grant is just such a great example of what we're talking about here and what we should be doing. You know, Paul says that we are supposed to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And like Greg Bonson used to say, every thought includes every thought. Uh, God's Word applies to every area of life. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, it was very encouraging to hear Dr. Grant. It was very encouraging to hear about supporting a political candidate that, has, that, that is saved and, you know, sold out for Christ and has, uh, 
the right values. So, you know, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So we could ask ourselves, what are our thoughts on economics, on education, on politics, on health care and medicine? Um, and like I said, I think Dr. Grant has shown us that we've been letting the world and the ungodly captivate our thoughts in these areas rather than Christ. We're just, we're just buying into everything they're selling, and this is not what God's image bearers should be doing. But the first step, really, in all of this is just getting people out of that dispensational mindset. So um, hopefully, you know, this, hope, hopefully this has been good information for everybody to, to you know, kind of do that when people raise objections because we need to get people to stop thinking that the horrible state of the world is the way things are supposed to be and waiting for God to rapture us out of here when God's waiting for us to do our job as his image bearers and change the world instead of waiting to escape the world. So.